This is AV Week for August 5th, 2011. Bring out your dead. Ready. AV, AV Week. Performing scan. Week. Online. This is AV Week. It is time for AV Week, your weekly roundup of all the AV news and commentary. With us today is Johnny Moda. Johnny is from Vistas Automation from Northern California. He's in home. It's a home automation company. Johnny, good morning. Good morning. And also with us is Matt Scott. Matt is from Audio. I'm sorry, Omega Audio Video, out of London, Ontario. It's afternoon where you are, Matt. Correct. It is. So good, good afternoon to you guys. Good afternoon to you. Also with me in studio is uh, Michael Drainer. Michael is from Tech Electronics from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. And my name is Tim. Uh, I will be your moderator for the day. Uh, gentlemen, the first story up is GovCom 2011. Um, and if my math is correct, I believe this is the first GovCom. Uh, according to Infocom's website, simply stated, GovCom 2011 is your number one source for evaluating new products, services, obtaining AV-specific knowledge, and skills through educational courses, learning directly from manufacturers through product-specific training, and networking with peers. Um, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but that sounded an awful lot like Infocom 2011. Yeah, I would agree. It probably is. Uh, the biggest thing that would be a plus for me in this type of uh, conference is I, I t- personally don't work in the government um, realm too much, but it, it hits me kind of like the difference between going to Infocom for all things you know general AV and going to NAB for uh, you know pro video stuff and broadcast stuff. You can get some of that stuff at Infocom, but if you want the specialized you know full bore stuff, you need to go to NAB. Um, kind of the same as, you know, going to Cedia for more residential stuff than, you know, what you can find at Infocom, even though you can find a lot of that stuff at Infocom. Michael, you're an integrator. Would you, do you have any, any reason to go to GovCom? Should you go to GovCom there in, in the St. Louis area? There is Scott Air Force Base, one of the largest Air Force bases that, that the government has. Large contingency there, lots of AV going on there. Should you go or should you take maybe some of your clients there? I don't find it real relevant to what we're doing day in and day out. Um, We've got our direct contacts with the military contractors that we work with, the military entities, other government entities in the St. Louis market. Um, We get our information dominantly from Infocom. I don't see GovCom as uh, something that's relevant to what I'm doing day in and day out. Now, from a end user standpoint, I think there's a lot of decisions that are made in Washington and Coming from that perspective, I think it brings a lot of value to those decision makers that would not normally attend an industry trade show that's focused at the integrators and manufacturers. So this is one that definitely caters more to the end user, in my opinion. So you're saying this is more of a government version of Educom? Correct. Okay. Correct. Johnny, I know you don't do uh, much business uh, with the government end of, of things, but can you see benefits because you know, as Matt said you know this is kind of the government version of Cedia or NAB is there a benefit for someone like an integrator to let's say you know traipse over to Washington DC and, and check out govcom um, for me personally I don't I don't know right away that if this like say this year I mean it's the first one if I would go to it or if I'm going to go to it it sounds like Matt was saying that it sounds like I could just go to infocom and get that same information plus more and at the same time, it, it almost seems that like GovCom is very specific niche amongst this group of of uh, AV such and uh, um, automation to the point where if you were in commercial specifically for government, that that's what you would be going to. And it just seems that like I might just end up going to Infocom over GovCom itself and get some of the same, if not all the same information. Some of it for me, and I definitely see a benefit here. Uh, for the government guys, uh, because what you have is, and I like Educom a lot, so what you have is you have, it's it's centric, it's in D.C., it's at, at the Walter Washington Convention Center in, in Washington, D.C., so you have some big players. I think maybe what they're, they're, they might be missing, because it's called GovCom, they're, that's probably why they're holding it in D.C., 
However, how many installations, what percentage of, of government installations are in D.C. compared to the rest of the country? You know, like I mentioned, we're, we're in St. Louis and taping this. Scott Air Force Base is one of the biggest Air Force bases that, that the government has on, on U.S. soil, on the continental U.S., there's this. There, there's uh, all. There's uh, the ones out in, in Denver. There's the ones out in, in California, in Utah, in Nevada. There are other installations that the government has. So D.C. isn't necessarily where the decision makers are being are. are. Well, and it's not just the um, military. You got to realize that there's other branches of government that AV is heavily integrated to. I mean, here in St. Louis, we've got the uh, U.S. National Defense Mapping Agency. We have. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, the National Record Center, and and you find those types of places throughout the United States. So, you know, at a very high level, GovCom plays to the end user. But I, I understand what you're saying, Tim, that that those decision makers are spread throughout the continental United States. And how does uh, a show like GovCom really cater to their needs? Yeah. So because they could just easily just go to Infocom, or you know have it a little more central located like right. not st louis but necessarily chicago denver In vegas vegas is nice <laughs> <laughs> okay okay real quick vote of the group who prefers vegas over orlando for infocom i do matt i haven't been to the infocom in vegas yet i just hit uh orlando this year um but i have been to a bunch of shows in vegas for it it's a toss-up for me. They're both hot. <laughs> <laughs> says, says the man from Canada, yes. Yes, yeah, says West the man from Canada. In Vegas. I'm sorry, Johnny, what? Sorry about that. I said I, I was unaware that there was an Infocom in Vegas. Um, because that was years Infocom, ago, wasn't it? Oh, did they, so they just travel around, right? Well, what happened was um, a few years ago, my, my very first Infocom was 2007. That was in Anaheim. And uh, that was at the Anaheim Convention Center. I think it's called Orange County, actually, which is ironic because the one in, in Orlando is also called Orange County. After that, my understanding was they made some kind of, of – there's they're, they're scheduled for the next I don't know how many years, and I really don't, to go back and forth between Orlando and Vegas. So in 07, it was in Anaheim. In 08, then, it would have been Vegas. 09 was back to Orlando. 10 was Vegas. This year was Orlando, and next year's back in Vegas. So I really don't know how many years they're they're ping ponging back and forth. All right, well, I'll just plan on seeing the two of you in Vegas next year. Yeah, the big the big plus for me of it being in Vegas is honestly they have more restaurants. Yes, and, and that's what and, it's all about for me. I can eat, <laughs> I'm with I'm you. <laughs> and stuff to do. It, it, getting around yeah, Orlando is, is definitely something. restaurants in Vegas is what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yes. you know, my wife calls me the uh, the self proclaimed well, connoisseur. Knows what happens in Vegas stays on the internet. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly, yeah. And, and Facebook and yeah. Twitter and yeah, yeah. The one comment I would make, um, just back to the location thing, is, you know, these trade shows usually move around unless they are, you know, just in Vegas uh, or something. There's never one perfect location that works for everybody. Um, you know, this year Infocom being in Orlando was great for me. I could just hop a flight down the East Coast. For somebody like Johnny, who's got across, uh, you know, the entire country, it's not going to be as easy. If they put it, you know, if it's back in Anaheim, that's going to be a whole lot harder for me. Much easier for Johnny. You guys being in St. Louis are kind of, you know, in the middle there. But I don't think it ever completely, you know, it, it'll never be good for everyone. Yeah, and that that's true. I mean, you you talk to uh, the vendors, and that the, and they're, you know. One one Tron is on is in Jersey. One Tron is in Anaheim, and so you know one year one Tron is happy, the other one the other the next year the other one's happy. So, well, and I think that's my point with the whole GovCom thing is, you know, you host it in D.C. because that's where you know the majority of the federal government lives. Um, but you do, like Tim said, there is a substantial number of people that are going to be coming from the West Coast, the middle of the, the nation, um, and actually from around the world, really. So I'll be, I'll be curious to see what the turnout's like um, at GovCom 2011 and uh, be able to recap that at a later date. All right, actually, speaking of Vegas, one of the stories that we had was, it kind of caught me, and it was, a, it was something that happened on Twitter, I guess, two or three days ago. This was about Claire Controls, C-L-A-R-E Controls. Uh, this is a new uh, control company, or a relatively new control company, that, that has... Uh, the company's not relatively new, but this product is. It is called the Claire Home Controller, and it is, it, it's a Mac-based home controller. This is something that I've kind of seen over the last couple of years with home automation. And, and Johnny, this is kind of your area. 
not only them, but also people like Control 4 and, and other people that are encroaching into the big control guy's area. Is this an issue for, can, you know, Crestron, Extron, AMX? Is, is this an area where they're, where they're somewhat vulnerable to these smaller, more nimble guys? Or are they just, you know, one or two companies that, that are making something that's kind of cool? They'll be one-offs and then they'll just, they'll fade into oblivion or they'll be bought up by one of them. Um, I see almost like a two-part answer with that is that like a example with Control 4 is like when they first came out, there was like a big push for them because they were far, far cheaper than say AMX or Crestron because, you know, they were the big boys in the, in the industry costing much more. But at the same time, those companies uh, are far more robust in, in, in ways that uh, of automation. At the same time, uh, they're also those guys are are have put out smaller systems like say example Prodigy for Crestron to kind of like not directly compete but in their own way I feel that, that that's what they're doing is putting out a product that that is supposed to you know be comparable to that smaller end system for a much a fraction of the price. Um, but then I also see like other companies like URC with their new um, total home control system that may be. Uh, kind of getting into that same field as, as we see towards the end of the year they're going to be re releasing a lot of product that may kind of com combat with that but I don't really see them overtaking like the bigger projects I, I don't think I'll ever see a big project on a high uh, end scale is like kind of what I specialize in is high end residential I don't I don't ever see myself or m many people if any kind of um, specking a big project to do something with those smaller end systems I have seen some of those smaller end companies or lower cost systems do high high end residential systems, but at the same time, I hear about some people using brand X lower end scale systems and hating it and ripping it out to use some of the bigger boys because they've seen how it works and is more uh, effective. The reason the, the reason I, I bring up Vegas is because last year during the the Infocom uh, show, one of the biggest ads in the Infocom daily uh, publication that they put out um, during the show was from Control 4 and the fact that they did the entire installation at Aria, which was the newest, fanciest, you know, latest, greatest uh, hotel and, and casino in Vegas. So these guys are kind of able to do larger, fancier systems. Uh, I'm just wondering if maybe Crestron is... Either they're they're not focusing on residential, or they're, they're and, and they're giving it to these guys, or they just kind of lost focus and they're 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 doing you know the DM and they're doing uh, they're doing the uh, whole building automation stuff. So you know that that's that's kind of my my question with that. Um, Michael, do you think that the Extrons and even Aurora they're losing ground to these guys, or are these just guys just kind of? doing their thing and it is room for everybody i think you know my limited exposure to the resi market is um keep that in mind when you're hearing my response here but the i don't know that the resi market's really been a primary thing for the the big system um control manufacturers it's it's more of a icing on the cake type thing if they get the residential it's a few extra dollars it helps with revenues but i think their big bucks really come from the larger AV integration uh, services. Thoughts on that, Matt? I, I would have to agree. They they definitely are grabbing, you know, much much larger contracts when they're working with you know corporate situations and and definitely the more commercial applications. That being said, in the resi market, you know, Crestron does have a especially in the high end, Crestron and AMX they really own that market. There are guys, you know, like Control Four, like all these other companies that are you know moving into that space and yes you know control four did do that the huge install in vegas which i would love to see how those quotes compared if they you know really address that as strongly uh, from a quoting side between you know with both amx restaurant savant uh control for some of the bigger players and i'd really love to see how that went down which i'm sure we never will no. but uh you know it's something where these smaller companies that have come up, um, I know we do a lot of URC stuff. Uh, we also do a lot of Crestron stuff. It's something where you have a lot of clients who, who on the lower end, 
just really have a hard time getting into, you know, some of the Crestron products. And they want some of that control, but they want it much more on a, you know, affordable basis. And that's where a lot of these smaller companies will be able to play and should be able to play very, very successfully. I know, you know, with a lot of the Control 4 stuff uh, that we quote against, it's stuff that sometimes we can hit it with Crestron. Sometimes we can beat it with Crestron, which is wonderful. Um, and then there's times where we can bring in, say, a URC piece and compete with the Control 4 piece perfectly. Hit every same, uh, same feature that they have and get it out the door and be done. Um, it, it's something where I really don't ever see, you know, some of these smaller companies. I, I don't ever see URC beating, you know, Control 4. Or I'm sorry. Yeah, beating Control 4 and definitely not beating, uh, you know, Crestron at their own game. That being said... You know, it, it is just different markets. It, it's like any other industry. There are people who, you know, can only go down so far as a Mercedes, and there's people who can never go above, you know, a Ford. And yeah. there's no no problem with either one of those. It's just it's different sections and segments of the market. So what what's your opinion on the um – I, I'm going to say the res. I hate to classify them as residential control system manufacturers, but that's really where we're seeing them—the the Claire and the Savants and, and people like that—as they start to encroach more into the professional market. Because you said something very interesting to me, and in, in, just a moment ago, and that was they can't afford the Crestron or AMX in the residential, so we see them in the in the high-end residential. But what about that professional user, that commercial user? who is trying to cut the corners and, and I use that term very loosely because it's still a quality product, but <laughs> it, it is called value Va- engineering. There you go. Yeah, taking the yes. VE solution into the commercial environment. How do we feel that the, that these other manufacturers are going to play in that world uh, coming down the road? Well, a lot of them are playing that hand very, very strongly or, or attempting to again, what it comes down to in, in the commercial market is um, I know we had a customer just this past week that we were working on a situation for, and they had bought the the essentially the entry level product and expected all this extra stuff to come with it, and we had to explain to them, well, you know, you're a company of five people, so no, you, you know, you're not able to or you're not able to justify all these other things. So when you're looking at the um, you know the the commercial market and guys who want to cut corners. There's definitely the pos- or and again we shouldn't pr- probably use the term cut corners, but you know be <laughs> value, very value engineering. Oriented. There's automation that they can get to do that, but again, there's going to be limitations on how far that can go. There's you know some systems where they can put it in and they can control you know a couple of their boardrooms and do that just fine with a more entry level system. But if you start talking a much larger corporation or a much larger building. There, that's where you're going to run into those limitations when even if they do want to cut corners and be more cost effective, you know, there's a limit to you, – you can't get everything for the price of nothing. You know, it, it's something where, again, unfortunately, the markets at this point, there's there are just essentially hard limits on what you can do with each product and each product line, mm-hmm. if that makes sense no it's insightful yeah it does and let me ask you guys this is when you're when you're competing with with crestron versus let's say control four is it a matter of the hardware doesn't match up so the crestron hardware is more expensive or is it the fact that when you get into those systems you have to pay a a programmer to program the Crestron, because someone who has gone to the classes and becomes a Crestron certified, that is going to increase the cost over, let's say, a Control 4 system, which is primarily just HTML. Uh, is, is that what, what, what is driving up the cost and making Crestron a little less competitive in, in the residential market? In, in the projects we see and that we, you know, we have competed on and, and worked against, uh, you know, Control 4 quotes and stuff like that, Again, it, it really does come down to what they're being quoted and what they're being offered. Uh, we quoted on a system a couple months ago that was a – it was a light commercial. It was a golf course system. And the Control 4 system that w- they quoted on, we were able to beat and actually beat fairly well. I think we beat it by 10, 15 points um, with a, a, a Crestron Adag- or the, the, sorry, a Crestron Adagio system um, that – actually did more than what their control for 
quoted system would do. And, and again, it there are areas where it's more expensive. There are areas where it's cheaper. It really it's it's hard to make a blanket statement on that, um, just because there's so you know it it really just comes down to what they're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to do. There are some areas where Control Four will always just be cheaper than Crestron at this point, just because of you know if you're adding these three four pieces. The only way to get that in a Crestron system is to add seven yeah. uh, or, or something like that. So it's it's really on a case-by-case basis. But yes, with Crestron, you know, there is a lot more um, work involved in becoming Crestron certified and becoming a Crestron programmer and what you can do out of the box. Whereas with a lot of the Control 4 stuff, um, I don't want to say that they'll, you know, give anybody a, a Control 4 <laughs> dealership, but it, it has kind of seemed that way the last little bit. That there's, you know, security companies everywhere popping up, slapping a Control 4 sticker on their van and saying, hey, we can sell you automation. And, you know, again, for the guys like Johnny and myself who are bigger crush on people, um, and Johnny does a lot more of this than even we do uh, as far as the the straight automation stuff, um, it, it is something where we put a lot of work into keeping, maintaining, and staying current on all the Crestron stuff, just because they are so big and are so advanced. Yeah, Johnny, talk talk to me for a second about home automation and the big players there. I mean, I'm I'm going to assume certain things about home automation. I'm going to assume that Crestron is in that mix and AMX is in that mix. But then you have Control Four. You have this 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 new company, this company that has this new Mac based system. Who else is there in the residential market that is? kind of duking it out for, for the, the middle and, and higher end residential uh, installations. Could you repeat the last part? You yes. kind of cut out there. You were saying, Sorry. like, who, who else is there in the who else higher, is, or higher automation systems yeah. that who, are out there who that else are kind of competing is, at that level? Yes, who else is in is in the that market? Who else is are the people fighting for the residential uh, dollars? I'd say, as of lately, it would, it would probably be Savant, but, like, a funny thing in that realm is that, like, uh, an example, it kind of goes back to other questions on, like, people kind of competing for lower-end systems and who using higher-end systems during this economy and why. Um, uh, local, Another local integrator here in town uh, is working for Apple. Well, some of the high-end people, like the, the, main, the main guy at Apple iPad development, uh, Mr. Jobsniak, if you will doing a job for them and he is not using Savant and at the same time their new facility that, uh, that Apple is making is definitely not going to be Savant from what I'm hearing which is funny to me and it makes me think that Apple doesn't even really care about Savant they kind of like yeah we're selling you know uh, we're selling our product in your in your system good for us but at the same time it doesn't really seem like that they personally are using their own systems what are they using just uh, out of curiosity but they, they seem to be in the last year or two I'd say making a lot of leeway in that higher end system for automation themselves, it just I just thought it was kind of interesting that that those employees of Apple themselves aren't using Savant. What are they using, Johnny? Uh, uh, Crestron, from what I understand. <laughs> I am <laughs> shocked. No, <laughs> I don't believe it. No, the, the reason the, the reason I, I ask is Sorry, that laugh was priceless. Yes. <laughs> the, the reason I ask is because uh, 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 so I mean. Even, uh, I mean, I, I would almost say, I mean, like, Control 4 has taken a big share of the market for a higher-end system that we've seen for, uh, I saw the article on CU Pro where they were doing a, I can't remember the, the number there, but it was a pretty pretty big install where the entire house was uh, Control 4, and I'd like to see how it turns out. Um, I know there's a lot of, you know, changes in, in, in the end there, but I'm kind of curious to see how that one plays out. And then at the same time, it'd be nice to see what they have in, in comparison to just say AMX or Crestron or another system to get that and see what price ranges were. I'm probably sure that Control 4 is going to be cheaper, and that's how they started, or they decided that anyway, was the, the cost factor. But at the same time, like I said uh, originally with Control 4, not to knock their company, I think they're great, is that uh, I've just heard a lot of people, uh, or local, local Control 4 people, because there's so many in my area, uh, talking about how how easy it is to install it, get in, get out, but at the same time, it just, it's just buggy. It's just really buggy, and that's like their one complaint. Is just, it's it's really well, it's really cheap to get in and out. It costs less, and people are all about it, except for the fact that it's really buggy for the end user. Hmm. 
the, the, the reason I ask is because one of the, uh, for me, surprising thing that's happened in the last couple of years is the emergence of Extron as a player in the control system. And the reason I say that, yes, they've had the IP link stuff for a while, but two years ago at Infocom, they came out with the touch panels, the, the, the graphical user interfaces. And up until that point, all of the Extron interfaces were these push, push buttons. And that was one thing that AMX and, and, and Aurora and, and Crestron could always point to Extron. Now that they have the graphical user interfaces, are they going to be a player in the residential market or are they just you know this is you know just another added benefit that extron can give somebody like an education or a house of worship anybody i, I personally have never used extron although i do see them a lot in in the field um i think it may just be another push to, to try and to cling or not cling but kind of hold on to what they have currently and maybe even make a bigger push but i don't know if necessarily that they would be making any more leeway into that into that higher margins I, I just don't see a lot of it out there although i do see some just not very much matt do you see any in either the house of worship or the installations that you do where where extron is either competing or uh, maybe you're, you're going against an extron system and you're in your quoting uh, a, a savant or a, a crestron system we uh, i don't see sorry go ahead matt sorry um, we don't see it too often in the residential side. Uh, it is there a little bit. Um, usually when we see it, Resi, it, it's brought in by a, a homeowner who works in the a, or sorry in the, the IT field, and they use a lot of extron switches in corporate and commercial stuff. Uh, so you know they've grabbed something and brought it home. Um, in the house of worship market, we do see a lot. Uh, granted, I haven't seen much of their straight up automation stuff anymore. We used to see it a lot more, uh, or sorry, a lot, a lot more frequently in the past. But lately, it's just something that hasn't been used as much outside of you know we we see it all the time for uh, you know essentially really their their matrixes and their switches, but not so much of it being controlled. Most of it being uh, not a dumb switch, but you know push button switches, etc. And we've seen a lot of that market share kind of be eroded. And again, this is just from my personal experience. Uh, a lot of that market share eroded and picked up by other companies doing other things, whether it be you know com computer-based switching. And again, most of my experience in this realm is house of worship, so it is you know obviously obviously a little bit different. Um, but a lot of it being picked up by either computer-based switching and controls like that, or something in a uh, you know, a broadcast or pro video situation where, again, they're just not using Extron as much. Here, here's one thing. I, I've kind of watched Extron over the last few years, and um, I work for a, a community college in, in Illinois outside of St. Louis. We were a huge, huge Extron house, and at, this has probably been five or six years ago. I asked them, I said, you know, do, are you, do you have any kind of graphical user interface? This this was before I, I knew anything about about Crestron or AMX or, or any other companies, but we were we were doing a, a large multi-purpose room, and I said you know this would be really cool, except you know the 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 powers that be, the decisions makers wanted a graphical user interface, and they said no you know if, if here's some things that we can do, I think it's something that you know they they have missed the boat maybe maybe for so long that it's going to take some time for them to catch up uh, against Control 4 and AMX and Crestron if they even can or if they even want to in the residential market. They may have no desire to be in the residential market. And if not, that's cool. But you've done, Michael, you've done, uh, you're a big, big Extron house. Do you, when you do installations, have you ever spent Spect an Extron system, uh, touch panel, or even button, uh, you know, like the little IP link uh, button, put button control uh, user interfaces. Have you ever spec one for residential? No, because I mean, first of all, we don't play in the residential market no, at all. Go. Yeah, so that's why I'm kind of deferring to Johnny and Matt on the the resi stuff. Um, I, I'm more interested in in the residential players coming into the, the commercial arena. So, I, but I can say on the commercial level, we do use the Extron stuff for small room systems, uh, little doctor's offices, uh, small office spaces where they need basic control. And I could definitely see the product lending itself well to 
the residential uh, arena, it just doesn't have the sexiness, I think, that a lot of resi people are looking for in control systems. Which I think is why they came out with the, the graphical uh, touch panels. Right. Uh, next story, guys, and this is something that uh, I think Matt said, are you surprised? PV files lawsuit against Behringer. No. Hey. Okay. Uh, Here's the PV press statement. PV Electronics Corporation, one of the world's largest manufacturers of musical instruments and professional sound equipment, has has initiated multiple actions against Behringer for various intellectual property issues, including patent infringement, false marketing, trademark infringement, and unfair competition. Here's the question, guys. This goes beyond the world of AV. For the last few years, the, the, the big computer guys, Google and, and Apple and Microsoft and all of these, have been playing what's, in essence, been a throwback to Cold War days, gathering up as many patents as possible to protect against mutually assured destruction, kind of like the old, you know, gather as many nukes as you can get. And when I saw this story, I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, the, the, the whole patent dispute thing is, is kind of rearing its head in the world of AV. However, <laughs> upon closer examination, I find Crestron involved with it, with, with Savant. I find Vizio and, and Sony involved in it. So this is just another version of the mutually assured destruction and these guys getting their collars in an uproar over, over patent infringement. Is this something that we're going to see more of or is that this, this This is just, you know, PV and Behringer kind of, you know, sniping at each other, Matt? Um, I, I think it's something we're going to see more of because, as you had stated, you know, the com- these companies have been buying up patents like crazy. Um, it's also something where the market has become so tight, and by tight I mean, you know, very, very big and very full and very um, close so that you're seeing a lot of these companies going after where in the past they may have, um, you know, kind of let it slide, uh, to use that term loosely. Mm. They wouldn't have been as aggressive to kind of deal with this. Now, because there's so much more competition, even though our market is not as huge as, you know, some of the other types of markets out there, there's so much more competition that they're trying to protect any, any leg up they have over the competition. Uh, as in any way possible. I know we see that a lot with um, the TV patents and all that stuff that's been going down the last little bit. Uh, But we've also seen it for years with, you know, Crestron and Lutron going back and forth over light switches. And, you know, it it is. It's just something where I think we're going to see it more, and I think they're probably going to start publicizing it more because I know with, you know, Behringer and PV, that's something where, you know, a lot of the people who have used Behringer over the years – they know that they're buying essentially uh, some form of a knockoff of some other product, and it just comes in at a lower cost. So, it, you know, it's something where we've kind of known about it in the industry, and it just either hasn't happened as much or hasn't been as, uh, as well publicized as it is now. All right, here's the ne- next story then. We'll move on. Uh, I, the the story I sent you was for the Panasonic. Panasonic uh, introduced their new twenty thousand dollar turnkey video system. Th- this struck me because over the last ten twenty years, we have moved from the giant uh, studios, uh, not only in educational insti- insti- institutions but also in the local TV markets. And now you have things like. Um, New Tech has all of their TriCaster stuff. Uh, matter of fact, the, the, the guys over at Twit, that was that's their their key piece is a, a piece of, of New Tech equipment. Then you have Panasonic with theirs. Are, are, have we moved away from the big, massive broadcast installations? And are we now into a more economically friendly uh, production studio, Michael? I believe so. Um, as, as a former broadcaster, I, I spent six years in broadcast engineering for a, a local television group here in St. Louis. And, you know, when we built our facility, it was about a one and a half million dollar investment for a, a small three camera studio, a full SDI switcher, a 2ME Grass Valley uh, switcher, big Encore router. And, and it was a lot of infrastructure and a lot of capital. But with the Um, affordability of HD technology coming down. It's making it much easier for the average consumer 
to produce high definition content on a budget. And I think, Matt, you can really speak to this in the house of worship market. Uh, what, what you're seeing in churches, uh, in their ability to produce high def content. Oh yeah, this is, this is killer. I, um, when I saw this link come across my desk, I somehow missed it when it was first released and saw this and went, Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Cause even last year alone, we did a couple, uh, consulting projects with a couple of different churches and looking at some form of this system. And it was a little bit more pricey than it is in the package. Uh, but this is, you know, for a lot of the type of churches and ministries that we deal with, this is a great entry level system that you can do. It gets you into that, that true, you know, pro HD level, uh, you know, again, not to the farthest extent, but it gets you in the door. Whereas before you were spending that much money, just to get into a prosumer level, which, you know, as you and I both know, is is not the same. Um, it's something where not only is it a great package and a great price, it is actually good products. This is good stuff. Um, it's something that just makes it so much more attainable uh, to churches and schools and, and anybody else. But that's what we want to see in the industry is, you know, uh, everything just becomes a little bit more cost effective. Absolutely. And, and, you know, to put this in perspective, five years ago, 20 grand was getting you into an entry level prosumer system where today you're, yeah. like you said, you're doing full high def quality entry into broadcast quality. And and I think that the lines between broadcast prosumer and consumer are really there. That gap is really starting to narrow and it has been narrowing for quite some time. You can't really say that um, I have to have that, that hundred thousand dollar Ikigami or Hitachi camera anymore. There are some small cameras that are putting out some amazing pictures these days. Yeah. It, it's something where I remember when X games, uh, to use them as an example, first brought out and started using, uh, XL ones and XL twos. And then the XL mm -hmm. HD cameras for actual broadcast quality, uh, stuff back in the day, kind of pre HD, and I remember watching that and going, this is ridiculous. I, I, when was the last time we actually saw something shot on cameras of essentially this low quality and this low cost that actually works and gets right. you something that you can use? So when that you know kind of started the ball rolling and now just where everything is, it's shocking what you can do with you know a $5,000 camera. No, it is. And, and one of the, the stories I, I sent you guys was the new Twit Cottage, the, the cameras they're using. And I want to say they bought 30 or, or 40 of these little handheld. Uh, eight, technically, they're HD. You know, they're, they're 720p. Well, they, <laughs> the whole thing's debatable, too. It <laughs> what, what is HD? Don't, don't, don't start. <laughs> technically, they're HD, but there's like 36 of them. And they cost two or three grand a piece, and they threw them up all over the studio, which which makes it, you know, a little uh, incredibly cost effective to do something very cool like that. I think I remember my, my first the first camera that my church ever bought was twenty thousand dollars. So you know, and that was twenty years ago. So um, finally, guys, this came across my desk this morning, and I, I don't know if I'm supposed to to read this, but you know, it came across my desk. So what the heck? Uh, the Crestron. Transition from analog to digital, get up to 100% trade-in credit. That's right. I said 100% trade-in credit for all of you wonderful end users. Bring out your PVID, QM, and IM system into the digital age with the Crestron Digital Media. It's quick, easy, and highly profitable. So basically what Crestron is saying is this. Bring us your poor, your tired, your huddled mess of analog systems and we'll give you brand spanking new digital. Johnny, are you going to call all your, your residential guys and say, hey, you know, throw down, get rid of your, your VCR and I'll bring you a Blu-ray player and a brand new digital media box? Definitely, definitely. I saw that, I got that email this morning, just like you did, I'm sure, and uh, it's definitely one of those bring out your dead moments. You, it, I was talking <laughs> to one of my clients the other day about how he has this huge uh, distributed audio video system, PVIDs and such. That's completely crushed on, and how you know very soon that's just going to be a big paperweight. And he looked at me with like the biggest stare of like, "You're kidding!" You know, I just bought this you know X amount of years ago, and I looked at him like, "Well, technology changes, you know, every so often, and it's, it's not something I did to to fool you or whatever. It's just something that's happening. I'm making you aware that in about say a year or two, 
this is going to be obsolete and you're going to have no video content anywhere. And now that I see that, I have a chance to, to say, you know, hey, uh, remember the other day I was talking about this and, and you were like, I don't want to pay for all this stuff. If he has a chance to, to take out that entire system and have up to 100% just like swapping out and all I have to do is charge him the labor, I could see him, I mean, you would just be ridiculous, uh, silly not to, to hop on that train. I mean, it, a little bit of labor, yeah, I get it, but seriously, if you can just trade a box for a box and a little bit of labor time, why wouldn't you want, not want to do that versus just having a bunch of equipment in a closet or wherever it may be that does nothing and you spent a buttload on it? I would be upset myself. Well, absolutely. absolutely. Or the other option is to just, you know, throw it in a closet or throw it away and buy all brand new. Matt, is this something that not only House of Worship, but your other installations that you could bring to your customers? Because, you know, I, I get the church market. Believe me, I do. Um, you know, I, I, I help our, our church out. And, and it's part of the conversation is the, is cost and money and resources. But this is something you could take to them and say, OK, you know what? I get I get budgets, but here's something that you can do to upgrade your system from the old stuff that you have now and bring you more into a more modern age. Yeah, it, it's definitely something that we're going to try and uh, essentially leverage as much as possible, not only to you know help us as a company, but also help our customers. Because especially as I'm sure you know, working with churches, a lot of times they're not going to drop you know that entire system cost at once. They'll try and essentially almost do a piecemeal and you know do a little bit here a little bit here a little bit here so with this type of offer it's something where hopefully we can go to a lot of our customers and clients like that and say hey you know we can help you upgrade this system right now get you into essentially you know the 21st century uh you know with the latest and greatest stuff and it will really you know cost you pennies on the dollar when we're just talking labor rates so it, it's something that you know especially in the house of worship market i think can be uh, used very, very effectively. And, you know, major, you know, props to Crestron for doing something like this because it is extremely frustrating uh, for both us as integrators and, you know, our consumers when you buy something and within two years it's completely outdated. So, it, you know, any time that we can help them upgrade and, you know, just better their systems with minimal output for them is obviously better for everybody. Michael, you do a fair amount of installations in the education market. And just like with the House of Worship, there are budgets, there are issues, and I get that. But is this something that, let's say that three or four years ago, you did a brand new installation? Technically, that system should still be viable. That system should be still robust and working. Is this something that you can take back to your college or university or K-12 through uh, installation and say, hey, look, you know, I know we just did this, but, you know, here's some digital stuff. It, it'll work. I swear there's not going to be any changes. Three or four years ago. Try three or four months ago. Okay. You know, I, I mean, we, we still have a number of, cl of uh, clients that, you know, you, you educate them about digital and the importance of it, but they say, we don't have the budget. Give me VGA. That's all I need right now. Let's move forward. So we do it. You know, it's what the client wants. Um, you know, you educate them and you try to try to progress them with the technology. So now this kind of changes the game because we can go back to those systems that we just deployed and say, hey, by the way, <laughs> we can trade this stuff up now. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to look real good, but, you know, it, it's bringing some value to the customer. I'll be interested to see, though, how the other manufacturers follow suit if they're going to follow suit. I think this is a brilliant, brilliant marketing ploy by Crestron to, uh, to get their product into many different um, client spaces. And I think that the competitive manufacturers are going to be amiss if they don't follow suit with some sort of program that's similar to this. Okay, here's a stupid question. Who can follow suit? Because who's doing DM or something like DM? Well, DM is not necessarily, they're not going to be capable of doing digital media, but there's no reason they can't offer upgrade programs from analog to digital systems. I mean, the E's and the A's and the, and the other A's that are out there uh, definitely have the ability to say, hey, bring us your old uh, VGA matrix and we're going to give you an SDI matrix or we'll give you an HDMI matrix, whatever the case may be. So, so there are other ways to bring upgradable solutions on a trade-in program like this. Good point. 
gentlemen i thank you that is all the time we have today for this week or this uh that's all the time we have for av week this week uh with us today has been johnny moda he is at jmota number three on twitter johnny thank you thank you anything you want to plug or or uh or promote uh you could uh, catch me on the inner tubes at uh blogging for visas automation uh www.bsys.us forward slash blog uh various other blogs or more importantly at ravepubs.com part of the rave blog squad and yeah i'll see you there all right uh matt scott is from omega audio video it is exactly that on twitter at omega auto audio video matt anything you want to uh plug or promote uh, nothing major to plug. Just you know, keep putting automation. Get rid of all your remotes. Let's do this right, people. Michael Drainer has also been with us in the studio. Michael's from Tech Electronics. That is Michael M I C H A E L Drainer D R A I N E R on Twitter. Michael, thank you. And anything you want to to plug or promote? Just keep it going, guys. Have fun. Uh, my name is Tim, uh, Tim Albright. It is T.D. Albright, T-D-A-L-B-R-I-G-H-T on Twitter. However, um, at the conclusion of, of this, um, last week's actually, we started something new, uh, and then I, I called it avnation.tv, and that's where all of this is going to be hosted and, and, and held, and, and so that's that has a Twitter handle that's avnation.tv on, on Twitter. But also, anybody has any information or, or ideas or, or comments or anything, uh, either go to uh, e- email us, um, which is um, uh, Tim at TimAlbright.com, or just go to the AV Nation website. It's avnation.tv. Also, if you would like to leave a comment, have a question for any of the commentators we've had so far, I got us a Google voicemail. It is 219-23-AVTV1. 219 219- 23 AVTV1. That's 219 232 8881. If you don't have the alphanumeric on your uh, on your on your cell phone or your your how your Albus phone. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, this has been AV Week. Mm-hmm.